Every image has a story, and well, this one certainly does. In this episode, we analyze, restore, and tell the tragic story of the Tittle family within this photograph. It certainly had my attention. This image comes to me from Genealogy TV insider Deb Andrew. Listen to her tell the story of the family as I attempt to restore this badly damaged photograph. We'll get to all of that in just a moment, but before we do, let me introduce myself. My name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further, faster, and factually with your family research. Now make sure you subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time we upload a video. Genealogy TV is on Facebook and has a newsletter. Links for that are in the show notes below. You can learn more about Genealogy TV Insiders at genealogytv.org forward slash insiders. It's basically co group coaching. Okay, so if you want to learn more about how to restore images, check out the playlist that I have on the screen right now. Lastly, if you want to try your hand at Photoshop and would like to try and restore your own photographs, there is a, an affiliate link uh, in the description below on how to purchase Photoshop. It's for as little as 10 bucks a month. All right, buckle up. Here's a very unique episode on Genealogy TV right now. Thank you for allowing me to play with this photograph. <laughs> it certainly is. Um, it certainly is one of the uh, more challenging images I have restored. And you know, I'm. I don't know. We'll see what happens with it. So tell us a little bit about this family. Who who are they, and where are they from? This is my great grandfather and grandmother, and they were they lived and were born in excuse me, she was born in Georgia, but he was born in Marion County, Alabama, and so were all the children. He was born about 1875, and she was born in 1880 in Cherokee County, Georgia. Tell me about him and what his name is and where he's from. And... This is James Francis Tittle, also known as Frank, and he and our family is larger than life. His story has been passed down through the generations by his daughter-in-law, not necessarily his son. Um, he used to ride a great big white stallion around on his property. He had 160 acres that was part of the land warrants and bounties of Alabama. And the first time he ever drove or tried to drive a car when they first were invented, he tried to stop it by saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, <laughs> ran, then, and then ran right into a tree. <laughs> oh, that is so funny. Uh, he was a very tough man. He um, looks tough. Uh, he, had, he was a farmer. His father was prosperous and, and his great no, his grandfather was a pioneer of um, Northwest Alabama. And so, so was his wife's family. They all came in about the same time. Uh, he had a tragic ending. Uh, his uncle by marriage started a fight with him over some music. And they wound up, one of them was killed, which was the uncle. And he was tried for first degree murder. But there was a death case confession from Jeremy Cox that he, Jeremy Cox, started the fight, but Frank was sent off to prison, and his tale at the end is about how he sent for his son, Bart, which is my grandfather, who's not in the picture where it's torn out, um, to come, and he would tell him where the land was on the property. But my, my grandfather, Bart, was very angry with him, with leaving him with three small children to, to look after, and do the homestead at the same time. So he eventually went, but by the time he got there, his father had died of TB. And so they, their story was they never found the money or anything, but the true story is that their father had sold the property to the railroad to pay for the lawyers to keep trying to get him out of jail. They did, like a, they did change it from first degree to manslaughter. So How they, long was he in jail? He was in... From 1914 to 1917, he was at Wetumpka. So he was only in for three years for yeah, manslaughter. He, for man, well, he died in prison. Um, oh, he did? He died there in Wetumpka. Uh, so it was a very tragic story. Uh, he's dealing with the loss at the same time when this murder or manslaughter incident where his wife has died from childbirth with their youngest child within a year. 
of that. So they were already in grief. Mm -hmm. And did you say that this woman's the one that died or it was his mother? No, she died. All right. So let's, let's hear about her story. Uh, Susan Anna Potts, also known as Annie, married my great grandfather in 1896. They were going to produce eight children. Two of the children died young. Uh, Jane Clare was the youngest one, and she's the one the mother died in childbirth with. The other one is a little girl called Della, and she's between the little boy standing behind her and the other one right behind her. Right. She's not in the picture. She died when she was 42. And she died in childbirth, did you say? Yes. So, uh, Annie, um, his parents were Jefferson L. Potts and Susan Mariah Potts. Jefferson dies after they get to northwest Alabama in Marion County. And Susan, the mother, marries a man that is 17 years younger than herself. And I had always wondered how James and Susan, Anna, or Susie Anna, she's got several names, um, met. Well, their properties are very close together in Marion County, so it was within walking distance, so they could see each other's land. So they probably met just like everybody does. They were a neighbor. Um, she is um, very stern looking, and this is the only picture we have of her. She's almost the complete opposite of her other sisters, what they look like. And she's, I just don't know much about her. She died so young and didn't leave much of a story. She looks, I think she's actually a lot better looking it, besides the damage that's done on the picture. We've cleaned her face up a couple of times. But there's always that differential in the shading of the real light to the light. But she's, um, she had eight children, and she had to bury... One when she was alive, and the other child was killed later, a little bit later after she was deceased. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the oldest. I'm assuming this is the oldest daughter. Yes, she's the oldest child. That's Siller Tittle, and she married Joshua Collier, and she had a bunch of children of her own. She was she helped take care of the youngest child. Um, Jane, and she also moved to Tennessee and took Jane with her for a bit. Jane came back to Alabama. She has a daughter still living that is 92 years old and a beautiful young lady, but she also had one of her daughters killed in one of the first airplane accidents in Missouri. Wow. So she's led, she led a hard life, and but a good life. I, had, I actually met her when I was a child. Um, she lived in the same town as her brother for a while. I was just too young to really take it all in who that who she really was. She was Aunt Siller. Everybody called her Aunt Siller, and she was one of the adults. And they did they were sharecroppers and picked cotton. Uh, she didn't have much schooling as the rest of them didn't either because they were helping to keep each other alive. Support the farm, yeah. I worked the farm, and what little they had, they, after Frank went to uh, prison, they kind of all dispersed. Joshua took her up to Tennessee with Jane. Um, my grandfather stayed in the same town in the same county as it, um, where everything happened. The young man next to her is Alex Tittle. Um, my gra he's older than my grandfather by just a year or so. And he and the other little boy in the picture that's with the doll uh, were very close. But he, go, um, he leaves the area, too. He has a tragic ending. He marries a lady that's first husband got killed in World War I. They have several children. He has a funny thing about him and the fact that when he, he got locked up for a bit in the same prison where his father was for moonshine and he was registered there for the world war one draft in Wetumpka. <laughs> so even if you're on a chain gang or that or short sentence they still registered you for the draft at least in alabama they did uh he died later he was still a fairly young man he died in 1933 of tuberculosis from working in the coal mines in southern illinois oh, that's tragic and when do you think he was born 
Do you know? Uh, yeah, he was born in 1897. Wow. I, you know, I, I've, as I've been working on this image, I've been looking at this, um, this face and this attitude. I mean, he's got attitude, you know? Yeah. Look at that haircut. That's a bowl cut. <laughs> yeah. Well, the first story when I was trying to find them, I knew their names. I've heard them all my life, but I didn't know where they were at. Nobody knew where they were at. So I called some of my older first cousins. Some of them are 20 years older than I am, asking where these two boys were at him and the little boy holding the doll. And he, they said, well, I think they killed each other in a fight, and which wasn't true. Or they might be in Joliet State Prison in Illinois, which is a maximum security prison. Um, I called there, and they said, no, they never had any people by this name in, in wow. prison. And they checked the system, too, so they never had any of these. But they kept popping up in southern Illinois. So I finally looked him up, and yes, they were the two guys that I was looking for. And he died, like I said, of tuberculosis. He had several children, and he has descendants in that county and in the state. But he, his family lived less than 10 minutes from my family, and we never knew they were there. Wow. And now his relation to you is? He would be a granduncle. Granduncle, okay. His children be first cousins to my mother. Okay. All right, let's talk about this little guy. <laughs> That's Morgan. Morgan's an interesting character, too. He lived with some um, one of his younger aunts uh, when all this was, stuff was going on. Um, he got married fairly young, uh, about 18 or 19, and then he took off with Alex to go to Southern Illinois to mine coals. Now, he has a very tragic ending. He um, gets killed or crushed between two coal mining cars, the little carts they load the coal with before they take it out and load it on bigger. They s smashed him, and he died. He had several children, uh, three, and they... Um, his wife went back down to Alabama. She stays there for a bit, marries another guy. Then they move out to California, and we can't find any de other descendants for now, him. The coal lived. mining accident happened where? In Franklin County, Illinois. Okay. At a, um, a little place called Ziegler. <laughs> I wonder if they went up there because that's where the work opportunities were. Yes, it was uh, during that time period from the early 20s into the, almost the 40s, there was a coal mining boom. One of the largest in the country was going on. If you wanted to get good pay and you wanted a steady work, you came to Southern Illinois to work in the mines there. Ziegler has one of the lar had one of the largest mines in the world. And Z Ziegler was petitioning for the capital of the United States to be brought to southern Illinois because it was in the middle of the country. Just a tad bit of history there. <laughs> um, I find it interesting the way this young man is dressed. He's holding a doll, in, and the doll is in a box, it appears. We think it's because his sister had died about that time. Uh, his, his Della. The little girl that nobody knows. Um, there's no pictures of her. There's only a headstone. There's not a death record of any type. There's no Bible records. We know of her because of her headstone. And her and him have a conflict of birth dates. I have his death certificate. They, uh, I can't get his... Um, they couldn't have been twins, could they? I thought that in the... He's o uh, older. Okay. I, I think with with the loss of her, they just put the first date down, or they may have sent one of the kids in to the stonemason and said, tell them what to put on there. We don't know why. Uh, it's a conflict. They got the same birth year. But she dies. Then um, Morgan's born about 1903, I think, because she's born in 1902, if give or take. We could swap them around. Uh, and the next son is born in... 1904, which is the little boy you have your pointer on. That's Jonas Pete Tittle. He's named after a couple of other Tittles named Jonas. And um, his relation to you is what? He's a granduncle. He is. So your grandfather is not in this picture. Nope. He's that torn section. 
<laughs> okay. Out. He was very angry with my great grandfather for getting in prison and leaving him with all the tail, everything to take care of. The other two, Alex and Morgan, were running around <laughs> every place and not at home. And he's left to take care of Jonas, Pete, and Robert, who's not in the picture. Robert is the baby I think she's carrying in the picture, if she's pregnant, because he's born right in, in there. He's actually born in 1909. All right, and so this child, tell me again this child's name. Jonas Pete Kittle. And he was born when? He was born in 1904. So that dates this image to be about 1902? He's about 1906, because he's born in 1904. So he's a little... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I had it backwards. Yeah. Yes. So he grows up, he lives with another family for a bit too in Alabama, the Chastain family, um, who has a very large and prolific family. Um, he traveled all around the country as well. He went, he met his wife in Tennessee. He makes it all the way up to, uh, I think it's Wyoming. And then he comes back for a bit to the middle and then goes out to California and spends the rest of his days out there. This little boy, though, has a tragic beginning because the little boy that's born after him, Robert, he's about six years old when he's born and all this other stuff. But Frank's going on in prison in 1914. Um, they're trying, him and Bart are trying to put food on the table to feed themselves. And he had went out hunting with a gun to get squirrels. They were, they hunted all the time. So it was an unusual. He had put the gun down, laid it down on a bed, and Robert, who is probably about three uh, at the time, uh, grabbed for the gun, and he scuffles with Jonas, and the gun goes off and kills the little boy. Oh, my goodness. The one so that's gun, not in the picture. The one that's not in the picture. Wow. So Robert is a tra very tragic and because one's his mother's dead, his father is in prison or in the Huskow at this point in 1914, he's in the local jail. Um, so they're trying to make ends meet the best they can. They've got a toddler basically in the house too, and it tore Jonas Pete up for the rest of his life. He never forgot that little boy. He actually named his first son after his brother to keep his memory alive. So, and then his son, Robert, is in hospice right now. Oh, my goodness. So, the, he, but his, his son, and he has grandchildren and great-grandchildren, his line's proceeding forward. But this was the very first thing that Jonas's children told me about. He had a daughter as well. And she died a few years ago here where I live. I got to meet her, and she was like a carbon copy of my mother. <laughs> and she wow. actually, she actually had met my mother and wanted to adopt her and take her back to California with her. And I said, well, she probably would have loved it because she liked to go all over the place. But um, if you did, I wouldn't have been here. Um, it's just that his family, of all the sections, you feel most for him because anytime someone's in an accident where someone's harmed or killed, they have to bear it, especially such a young age. They were. Oh, goodness. So the little boy that was killed would be about his age uh, when he died. Wow. And, you know, when I saw this image, it's ironic that he is, you know, after learning that story, that he is sitting here staring at a gun almost with fear in his eyes. You know, he's kind of like, he almost looks like he's trying to get away from the gun. I see it as more as a curiosity and not fear uh, because they would have guns all over the place. They did. And it wouldn't mean something that he would have been scared of. Um, they also, I had some other people that when we looked this up, there's, uh, the photographer often used props like this in that area. We've got a few others of other people from the same locale that right. have pistols in their hands. Right. Um, like yeah, it's but I've a, never seen one pointed at a child. I, I know. I said, nowhere, no matter where this picture goes. It's probably actually pointed in front of the child, but it looks yeah. like it's pointed right at the child. She's actually holding a, some kind of cloth around him, or he has a little covering over his sleeves yeah. to keep them clean. I just, my mom loved this man. 
and my grandmother did too. They could not say a bad word about Jonas Peach, but I thought his name was unusual to be Jonas and have the bad luck to kill his brother by accident wow. and having that name. He has blue eyes and so does his son and his grandsons and they all have the same uh, profile as the grandfather, the very sharp nose. Now my brother's son looks is a carbon copy of his great grandfather Frank that's in the picture. Wow. So he looks exactly like him. And his kids have this guy actually has dark red hair. And well, so I'm looking he's got kind of a blondish hair and this other boy has kind of a medium light blonde hair. At least in the as far as the black and white image goes. goes. But um, she, I think she has blue eyes, or no, they weren't blue, they were green. She has green eyes, and it's a trait that passed down. My mother has green eyes, my brother has green eyes. I didn't get that. I got brown eyes. Um, and so Do you know what the uh, ancestry line is for this family? The pots, uh, they all come out of Georgia. Do you know where they jump the pond? No, and even the, I don't know on the other side. We got some DNA matches that are linking us back into the other lines that always said that we weren't related. But the tittle line is coming in with the first tittles very early 1700s. I don't have proof I got DNA, but you know how that goes. Um, well, the green eyes and the blondish hair might be a clue in some, some respects. Yeah. So we know her, we have pictures of her, all her sisters, and they don't have quite as dark hair as she does. Theirs is a lighter. A little bit lighter. Uh, her her mother, I have a picture of, and it's her hair is dark, so it may be coming from her her grandfather's line. But they all have. If you're in this line, you're just going to have this shape of face between these two, with that high, straight nose and high cheekbones. Yeah, uh, very prominent through the line. I got more of my father's line. In me, and I finally, after all these years, found where my dimple came from. <laughs> she's got very sharp eyes. Yeah, she's. She looks like she's glaring right through you. Yeah, she's serious. Unless she was just saying, "Get this over it," because I'm gonna yeah. hurry up. Know. I gotta go to the bathroom. That's right. <laughs> I'm assuming, like I said, I'm assuming she's pregnant in the uh, in the. She might have been. Because of the been. dates of the children, she'd be early on in it. But they're all, like I said. Once these two had their mishaps, then there was a domino effect to all the family that tore it up for generations. So he goes to prison. Wait a minute. Let's think about this for a minute. You date this photograph to be when? About 19, 19, no, 1906. 1906. Excuse me. All right. So we date the photograph to be roughly 1906. 1906, 1907, somewhere around there. Robert was born in 1909, so, you know, we got a, he's like a, you know, he yeah. looks like he's almost two years old or maybe a little older. Um, he's walking, so we know he's not a year old. Um, and he yeah. goes to prison, Frank goes to prison when? 1914. Oh, so it's, a, it's quite a ways after this image. Mm -hmm. And this is the only known image of this family together. Um, Did you ever have the whole image? No. Where I have the original given to me by the little boy in front, uh, Jonas's sister. She gave it to me, and it was passed to her from another, I think it was Jane Clare that gave her the picture of the family. And so it's torn here. It was glued to a wooden frame, uh, you know, thick cardboard, I should say, not wood. Uh, so we've got the piece that hooks to the back, but there's no picture on it. And the only explanation that we can think of, and it was a story told so many times, you turn blue in the face hearing it, that Bart, Bart McKinley Tittle was right here, who's my grandfather. And because he was so very angry with him, we're talking, I'm not going to see him if he's even on his dead bed, deathbed, which he, he tore was. himself out of the photograph. So you think he's in the photograph, like right over here? Mm -hmm. He's older than Jonas Pete at the bottom, but younger than Alex at the top. So he's in between those two. This is he, Alex. Yeah. Okay. And this guy's name is what? Morgan. Morgan. Okay. Wow. What a great story.
I mean, their story is told so many times down the lines that even when I called the different family members, when I found each set of the families, I asked them to tell me the story of Frank. What did they know? And it was almost always exact. He was attacked by a man. He was he killed the man. He was sent to prison. He was innocent. And he had money on his property. Now, the Illinois bunch, which would have been Morgan's and Alex, thought the money was in Illinois because <laughs> it's like three or four generations. I and keep he's getting saying, confused about the money part. So well, he was supposed to be, they were supposed to be not rich, but not very poor either. They were above the poverty line, probably what we call upper middle class now. Yeah. So, and he had 160 acres. Her mother had a, a couple of hundred acres uh, or more. So, and his father was prominent in the community. And so was his grandfather before that. So he came from a very upstanding uh, family in the community. So for this to happen was very bad. Um, the man he actually killed, his married in uncle, had been hassling the older daughter a bit too. Um, he was probably just trying to defend his family. Yes. The, he was giving her attention that he shouldn't have been given. Yeah. Wow. So even though he had been restrained, and this, uh, the Jeremy Cox kept telling him over and over, I want you to play this tune. I want you to play this tune. Play it. And he didn't want it. They, he played the fiddle. Or oh. violin. <laughs> um, and there was a, a barn dance or some kind of party going on, and that's where it happened at. And there was lots of witnesses. And even though the witnesses testified that Jeremy Cox started the fight, and but he was supposed to be some kind of part of the local police establishment, uh, they went ahead and charged him with first-degree murder. Uh, and then, like I said, it was changed later to uh, manslaughter. Uh, so, if my my grandfather would have been about fifteen, sixteen years old at the time, uh, very upset, middle of adolescence, and having to carry the weight of the world of a loss of a mother and a loss of a father, and the disgrace in the community of having his father kill his uncle. Um, when I did research on him, I I called the granddaughter of the man he killed. She would have been a she's a cousin of mine, uh -huh. and I talked to her, and she told me the same story, because I was so nervous calling her. I'm used to doing cold calls. Yeah, she was. She made me very nervous because this this was her grandfather. Oh wow! <laughs> so I wanted to know what story she knew, and the first thing she said, he was a very very bad man. He had already killed five people, and he tried to kill Frank Tittle. So wow. she. She never met me. She never talked to most of the other relatives in our branch. She lives in a different section um, of, the, of the state. So the tale she was told was the same stories we had. And I said, there's some variations in the story, but nothing, the core is there. And we do have the court records for him. And I just imagine when he was standing there in court, nurse handing down his sentence, that he's thinking of his children and what, what were his children going to do without him. And they had no mother. And then his father is there and his mother watching too. And what a disgrace that he had brought upon their family. The guilt he must have felt, he just had to be stoic and hold it all in because there was nowhere to let it out wow. and, he, and he had to take it to the grave with him and, and I mean, they never found the money either did they um he sold the land <laughs> yeah but that means the money's still out there somewhere <laughs> no he he paid the lawyers with it oh uh, okay for the appeals and the court case it went on the appeals went on all the way up till he he died he was going to be released he died within a couple months of being released and having his um, everything wiped away. So I have a theory after listening to the story about this doll mm -hmm. in that I'm wondering if they gave the little boy to hold on to the doll uh, to represent the baby that died. That's what I was thinking. Like, like she's, you know, she's part of the family or, or maybe that was her doll. Yeah. Wow. 
that's what I, I that's what drew me. I always draw me to him. You see Jonas Pete first in the front, but then you kind of glide right up to him. And it's like he's holding this doll straight up and he's in a very masculine family. And dolls wouldn't have necessarily been. They could have been, but not necessarily part of something. And this doll is in a box. Yeah. That they're preserving, and he's holding it carefully and snugly yeah. up against himself. Um, I yeah, I think you're right. I, you know, I think I think they wanted to make sure the baby was represented, represented in the photograph. I know some people thought it was a some kind of picture. I said, no, it's three dimensional. If you get up real close to it, it's a three dimensional. And everybody wants to make this a, that. We see where the crack goes to the top on the left hand side. Yeah. Um, they want to make that a ghost. <laughs> Oh, I now said, you nah. can see his hands are curled around the inside edge of that box. Yeah. You can see the shadow of the box up here. It definitely is a three-dimensional box. And you can see where it jets out a little farther on the bottom right here. Yeah. I, t I told uh, other people that I looked at it, and I said, no, it's a box with a little doll in it. And I that told basically. Like a wooden box. Um, it could be a coffin, a little casket. Oh, my gosh. Now you're breaking my heart. Because uh, they often did that, you know. They really? Had, yeah, they had little caskets for little babies, and then they would have, maybe he built it. You know, they lived out in the country, and they... Like as a have, keepsake? As a keepsake, or put it to, to bury beside her, or put beside her. It depends wow. on their relationship, how close they really were. Uh, but it's sturdy. Yeah. Yes, uh, it appears sturdy. And um, do you know what religion this family is? Church of Christ. Well, it's certainly an interesting group. I was sitting there trying to see what that uh, is, if it's a piece of paper or if it's actually a, a, a handkerchief. It looks like a piece of paper to me. Now, the other picture I have of his father is on a postcard of his father and mother and the little girl that's not in the picture, the other little girl, the baby of the family that when the mother died, is on a postcard, which is an actually much better condition than this one is. Uh, like I said, this came on a mounted on a thick cardboard type of material. I think it had a cover frame probably on top of it. And then it lost just that edge, the left edge broke off and they kept it. And so then when they, you got it, it was in this condition, right? It was in this condition. As soon as I got it and received it from my uh, first cousin's wife removed. I brought it home. She says, I'm going to give you this because you'll know what to do with it. And I brought it right home, scanned it, and put the picture away in a, in the proper casings and put it in the dark. <laughs> and then I uh, started sending it out to the cousins so they could see what their great-grandfather and great-grandmother looked like. Uh, Have so you, this almost looks like water damage to me, but. Oh, there's water, there's ink. There's rust. Yeah. On there, the most of the damage is right across their faces, which it looks like ink to me. So it's a picture that has been handled quite a bit or stored in a rough place. But the way um, Jonas's daughter Jean handled and cared for that picture, it was very she. It was with reverence. <laughs> This almost looks like tape to me, like someone tried to tape it together. Yeah, and right across um, Annie's um, dress there over by Jonas's head, it looks again that there was tape or something done to it. It's just a sad, sad story. Near around 1875, there was a depression, monetary depression in the area. And then when he dies in 1917, there's a world war and then another depression. So all these children that are born and live into adulthood went through all of this and the Great Depression. And you, you see how they couldn't get ahead no matter how they tried. Some of the grandchildren went to school. Siller's children went to school. I think Alex's children went to school. My grandfather's children did not go to school very much. My mother made it to the sixth grade. They all had to work in the fields and pick cotton and just help the family survive. Um, I don't think he, if he did, um, Morgan, he knew very little. I think he could write his name uh, and that was about it. Coal mining is not exactly an easy job. <laughs> well, 
No, and they were probably going after it. They probably thought money and putting food on the table was more important than getting uh, learning to read and write, you know? Yeah, you know, they had to survive. They ran a large property, did the same thing. And also during this time, a lot of these guys would, in the downtime, there's a coal mine. There's several coal mines in the same area, and they would go work those mines in the off period over in Walker County. Um, so some people got killed there. There's where I think the, one of Susan's or Annie's um, brothers was killed there uh, in one of the mines. And he actually leaves a wheel. He names her in it. Uh, so it's um, sad. There was just a lot of hard work. Northwest Alabama is very rocky. Very, it's not inclined to be agriculturally <laughs> great. So most of the people would move out and come back. Uh, about the same time, those two uncles went up to Southern Illinois. My other great grandparents from England came came to Southern Illinois to do mining in the same area. All right, you ready? Ready. All right, here you go. This is obviously the before, and I had to open up the sides, but here's the before, and here's the after. Wow. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, you like it? Yeah, Annie looks so pretty. That's the mama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I had fun doing it. Uh, it. I learned actually. I learned a lot of new techniques doing this one. This is probably the hardest one I've ever done, no doubt. Hey, special thanks to Genealogy TV insider Deb Andrew for sharing her family story and the image. I have to say, <laughs> that was one of the more challenging uh, uh, rest restorations I've ever done. Again, learn more about Genealogy TV Insiders group coaching. You can go to genealogytv.org forward slash insiders. Or if you want to sign up for group coaching, one-on-one -on -one sessions, or become a patron of Genealogy TV, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash genealogy TV. To learn more about how I do photo restoration step-by-step, -step, I have a series link on the screen now as well as uh, the Genealogy TV website to make it convenient for you. Well, it's time for you to go find your ancestors. So until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.